uh, some of it by direct intent has not come down to what I would call super practical, what do I do about it now? What I've described is this holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And I said at the very beginning of this, the very reason for doing this is so that you, you have motivation, so that you have perspective, so that you, so that you keep moving, so that you don't lose heart while you go. I think it's very difficult sometimes to stay motivated as a Christian, particularly motivated to do the stuff we do normally, the life of a priest. You know, I would say conservatively, Father Gordon, 95% of what we do is boring, uh, and especially what we do between Sundays. <coughs> People think the priest doesn't work. All he does is work on Sunday morning for a, you know, a few minutes and then it's all over. No, the, in, Sunday's easy. That's the easiest part of the whole job. It gets really, really tedious sometimes. And there's so much stuff that needs to be done. And, oh, and, and, and what... Many of you, you put out a lot of effort, and, and the effort sometimes doesn't seem to, to gain what you wanted, but that's not even material. Sometimes, do you ever faint in your heart? Do you? Well, I do. Often I faint in my heart. I mean, I never say I'm going to give up. I never say I'm going to quit. Never cross my mind. But there are so many times when I've said, I wish I really felt all of this were worth it. You mean, do you have those moments? And sometimes they're not moments, sometimes they're longer than moments, sometimes they're weeks, and sometimes they're, they can even get into months. I mean, sometimes you, you say, am I depressed about this? Uh, if you do not have your sight set on where you're going, you've got a problem. If your success, even with a priest, if the priest's goal, if his idea for success is that he's going to build this big parish, he's going to have all these people, they're going to do all these things, that's really a rather shallow goal. It's really not very worthy. So what? So what if you do it? So what if you had a parish of 10,000? So what? You know what you got if you have a parish of 10,000? You got 100,000 headaches. You've got, you've got 10 squared. Uh, <laughs> there's just a lot. So tonight, the goal is motivation. Uh, and I mean practical. The, the whole thing has been motivation. That's why I turned you towards, I saw the holy city. New Jerusalem came down, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. But now what I want to do tonight is to get down to just the brass tacks. How do we live? while we do this. Well, <clears throat> I've taken some passages from Hebrews already this week. Tonight I'm going to work with you on the 12th chapter of Hebrews. I'm not going to take it all. I'm going to skip some things in the 12th chapter, but I'm going to start in a very familiar place. Therefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lie, lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, so he had to have a goal, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised in the shame, and it sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Uh, I'm going to, I want to work with that for a few minutes. The great cloud of witnesses. What's that? Well, if you went to chapter before, you read this great gallery, you know, Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and, and all, these, all these Old Testament saints. Uh, that's primarily what he has in mind. Seeing we also are compassed about with so this great cloud of witnesses, that's just what we've read about. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us. Folks, I think that if I've learned anything in the 69 years that I've lived, that most Christians are dogged by unnecessary weight and sin. What's the difference? When he says, let us lay aside every weight, 
It is so easy to let, I'm, I'm, I'm treading on thin ice here. It is so easy to let getting your kid to ballet or soccer get in the way of the things of God. It's so easy to let your house get in the way of the things of God. Anything that hinders you from running the race for Christ is a weight that is worth getting rid of if it's slowing you down. Now, I'm not saying don't take your kid to soccer. I understand taking kids to, to, to games. My wife thought she became a taxi driver at one point in her life, where all she did was shuttling kids. I mean, she'd get home from school and boom, in the car and shuttling kids here and there. And I didn't even understand in those days how much worse girls are than boys. Boys are easy, you just take them to a game. The girls, they have to go dance and do all this fancy stuff. Uh, I, I understand that there are things that we must do for our families. Uh, I have, you know where I put, you know where I put weight on easily besides here? Where I can put weight on is just what I want to do, even in my own home. Um, I do not start, Mike isn't uh, here this evening, but he would have, he would probably smile at what I'm going to say. Before I can start the Divine Liturgy, everything has got to be symmetrical. The tabernacle, that thing that sits on the altar, that's got to be in the middle. I want the Gospel book exactly where it belongs, in the middle. Uh, and everything needs to be in its place. No, no, I want everything in its place. Everything does not need to be in its place. My friends are cruel to me sometimes. We had a New Year's party. I think the Walkers were still living in, in Goleta, California when this happened. There was a New Year's party at my house one day, and um, Father Jack Sparks, and, well, speak of him, and here it is. Uh, Father Jack Sparks was there, and Father Peter Gilquist. Now, these are not good men. They are not good men. They are wicked. What they did is they went into my bedroom. Now, do you remember I told you there are certain places in my house who do not go? Well, they did go. Now, my wife would be furious at what I'm going to say. I don't even have a closet in our bedroom now. I'll get to the New Year's party. We have a nice walk-in closet. It is my wife's. There is no room for me. No room on the shelves. There is no room in the hangers. And there's no room on the floor. Uh, we're, sort of, we're sort of the odd couple. Uh, I, I see Felix and I'm... <laughs> who's the other guy? Oscar, no, I, I, I'm, I'm the guy that's just precise. <clears throat> My closet is like this. Shirts, but pullover shirts, by color. <laughs> Dress shirts, I do have a few of them, by color, and whether they have stripes or not. Slacks, black. Slacks, gray. Suits, shoes. Father Peter and Father Jack went into my closet and they mixed the whole thing up. <laughs> I mean, these, these scoundrels, they ruined it all. After I got over the nervous breakdown and got it all put back together, now we, we all laughed about it, but you know, <clears throat> a thing like that taken too far can be a great weight. You can waste so much of your life getting ready to pray that you don't. You understand that, don't you? You can spend so much time getting everything ready, getting the place ready, even getting your head ready, that you spend more time getting ready to pray than you actually spend praying 
And then when you start keeping a little book on it, you say to yourself, I spent this much time for my prayers. Well, no. You spent this much time getting ready. This much time with the prayers. <clears throat> there are so many things. We're in the season of Lent. I wish, uh, I wish Easter, <laughs> I look forward to it. I don't know, that. you know there's 23 services that, uh, that we do between Lazarus Saturday and, and Easter Sunday afternoon. And uh, I don't know about you, but the older I get, the, the harder it gets to do all those services. But you know, sometimes I am so grieved because sometimes there's just such a small handful of people. And for many of the people, there's a really good reason why they don't come. I mean, like they have jobs. But for some people, it's just they haven't laid aside the weight. And they're having a hard time running the race. Some even intend to get there. But they can't make it because they can't run the, It's too They're too encumbered. There's so much that wraps up your life. I read the other day, officially, Americans work more than any than people in any other developed nation in the world. Well, for goodness sakes, it must be that it's somehow some people aren't as encumbered with their work as we are. And it's not just work. When he says, lay aside every weight, he means weight. As you're going to see before I'm through, it means lay aside the weight that keeps you from making your dead-on target the new Jerusalem, the city of God. You wait, I'll show you that. Let us lay aside every weight and sin. If there's anything that has tended to discourage me over the last... But we, we were both boy preachers. He was a better boy preacher by far. Uh, and probably did more boy preaching than I did. You started about 17, didn't you? 16. And uh, I was probably about 17. But over those years, I see a change in the view of people towards sin. As a matter of fact, sometimes, you, sometimes even I feel that if I get up and preach about sin, that, well, it's not going to be a popular subject. People don't want to hear. They'd rather hear some really clever scheme of biblical interpretation than to hear somebody say, folks, you just got to quit sin. You know, it's not very hard to define what sin is. St. Paul said, therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight, for by the law comes the knowledge of sin. Uh, or you could take it, thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and your neighbor is yourself. And then you start evaluating your life according to that. You can figure out where sin is easily. I don't want to dwell long on this. Folks, We've got to take a serious attitude towards sin. Sin always has consequences. Always. It'll have consequence in your life. It'll have consequences in the life of your church. There is... <clears throat> I look out here and I think sometimes uh, when I go to a university and, and, and I would speak on the subject of sex, love, and marriage and uh, uh, I... I I would hear, you know, people would argue that, he, you know, a lot of kids would come out, hundreds, thousands of kids would come out, and what you would hear over and over again, as long as what I do affects only me, I have, I can do it. Two things. Number one, as long as you do it only affects you, it's still sin. But number two, there's, there's no sin, and I'll touch on this a little later, there's no sin of immorality that does not affect everybody. Everything you do, or that I do, in terms of our morality, affects Josh, Amy, Christy, uh, Catherine, Amanda, Joby, Stephanie, Gary, uh, Nicole, I'm going over my grandchildren. Everything you do, everything I do, it affects them. There are consequences. It creates an environment. And we live in this incredibly permissive environment. And that environment is luring my children and my grandchildren. And it's luring your children and your grandchildren. And for those of you who don't have any children yet, it's luring your children too. Be 
Because everyone in here, every kid in here is already raising his or her children. Every grandparent is still raising children. And everyone, we're, the, we raise, we're raising children. Anyway, I don't want to get, I don't want to go on that. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us. For some of you, the weight is just a simple matter of sleeping too long on Sunday morning. Nothing wrong with sleeping long on Sunday morning, so long as it doesn't get in the way of the worship of God. Which is more important under most circumstances. It's a slam dunk, isn't it? It's the worship of the living God. Okay. And the sin. Lay it aside. But that's not really where I wanted to head. I wanted my eyes on the next verse more than anything else. Fixing your eyes on Jesus. A danger amongst Orthodox Christians is getting their eyes fixed on the tradition. I love the tradition of the church. I love it. It's one of the main reasons I embraced Orthodox Christianity. I was sick and tired of having the tradition change every 37 seconds. I was tired of having to make up a new worship service every Sunday morning. I was tired of what Father Peter calls the church of let it happen. I was tired of the church of utter spontaneity. We were professionals at it, folks. We knew how to do it. It did not bear ultimately good fruit in and of itself. It did not bring stability. It didn't bring stability to us and didn't give stability to the people, spiritual stability to the people to whom we sought to minister. I love the liturgy. I love the tradition. I love doing essentially the same thing every Sunday. I love hearing blessed is the kingdom. I love hearing blessed is our God. I love hearing in peace let us pray to the Lord. I love praying for everything that the scriptures engender, uh, encourage us to pray for. But sometimes we get our eyes focused on that kind of thing. Or we can get focused on almost anything except having our eyes fixed on Jesus. I, did, did I, I, I may have mentioned this last night. If I did, I'm sorry. Because I'm going to repeat it. We do a service on Friday nights often, especially in the, in the Antiochian tradition. We do a service on Friday nights during Lent which is called Little Conclined with an Akathist to the Mother of God. Now, the word Akathist is a very spooky word. The word Akathist, ah means no, and kathisto is I sit. And so an Akathist is a service where you don't sit. <laughs> That's, but you see, if we give it a Greek name, it sounds wonderful, huh? So uh, it, it, it's Little Conclined with a not sitting to the Mother of God. Uh, and, and what you see in this service is there's these dozens of ascriptions made uh, to Mary. Every one of them has to do with Jesus. Every single one. And once in a while, someone will come to that service and they'll say, Oh, this is all, well, it's a pagan. All, you're, you're worshiping Mary. No. No, the service is about Jesus. However, some Orthodox Christians actually attend the service and their eyes aren't fixed on Jesus at all. Their eyes are fixed on Mary. And if Mary could speak out loud, she'd say, Get your eyes off of me. What's being said about me has to do with the son I bore. The service won't make sense to you if your eyes aren't fixed on Jesus. If your eyes are fixed on Him, it's wonderful. You'll go through scores of things, some really deeply theological things, and some just nice things that th are said about Him. You know, I, <laughs> you walk into a lot of churches, and, and across the front of the church, there'll be an apse, you know, this concave spot place up there, and there'll be this big icon of Mary with her arms out and with Jesus. And there's a name for this icon. It's, the one I'm thinking of, it's called More Spacious Than the Heavens. It was really interesting. I was in Pasadena, California, and I had a friend with me. We were, we were driving down Rosemead Boulevard in Pasadena. 
That's one of the major streets. And we went by a Greek Orthodox church. And I, <clears throat> as I went by, as we went by, I said, Sam, have you ever been in an Orthodox church? And he says, no, never even seen one. And so we did a U-turn, drove over to uh, this Greek Orthodox church. And uh, as you know, it's very common that it might not be open. And there's reasons why they're not open. You know, people like to mess around with our stuff. People like to mess with our hardware. But it happened to be open, and the priest happened to be there. So we walked into the church, and here is this huge icon of Mary across the front. This, is, this was a very remarkable experience, even for me, when I, as, as to what happened at this point. We walked in, and Sam looked at the icon. Well, that's all you could see first. I mean, there was nothing else that would catch your attention before that. And he said, Father, why? He had his eyes in the wrong spot. And I said, Sam, you're not looking high enough. And he looked up into the dome and saw another icon, the Pando Crocter, the Almighty Christ. And Sam's very bright. And here was, this was his response. Oh. <laughs> and instantly he made the connection, which perhaps some of you who had that icon in your church had never made. He saw that between there and the altar, was she who bore him, and the one she bore is the Creator, and we call her more spacious than the heavens because she held him who made the heavens. But when Sam got his eyes fixed on Jesus, Mary made sense. By the way, he's an Orthodox priest today. And as a matter of fact, he started holding uh, morning prayers, orthodox prayers in a seminary in Pasadena. And I imagine there's only been about 50 uh, converts that came out of that seminary so far uh, to orthodoxy. Most of them through the influence of this particular man. Having your eyes fixed on Jesus. Everything in our services is about Jesus. Today's John of the Ladder. What's John of the Ladder about? He's about Jesus. Today, if you were in an Orthodox church, when the priest came out and he sensed you, why did he sense you? Why did he sense you? Because Christ is in you. We don't go out and sense the world. We sense Christ. St. Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Well, if Christ is in you, I'm going to sense you. I'm not sensing, I do not sense the priest Gordon because of any virtue he may have because he's confessing during the sensing that he has no virtue. But I sense the priest, I'm going to, I'll sense him twice because Christ is in him. I'm sensing, not Gordon Walker, I'm sensing Christ in Gordon Walker. Having your eyes fixed on Jesus. You say, where did you guys get all this tradition? Where did you get all this stuff? It's the experience of the church over many centuries and how you experience Jesus Christ and having him in front of your consciousness all the time. If you have a, an icon in your car, why do you carry an icon in the car? Be careful. Don't carry an icon in your car to make yourself safe. Carry an icon in your car so that you can fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Him while you drive. Have something that calls to mind Jesus. It doesn't have to be an icon of Jesus. It may be an icon of St. Anthony, the patron of my community. But why do we pay attention to St. Anthony? Because we see Christ in him. We pay no attention to Anthony. He's just a hermit out on the desert. I mean, what's he doing? I mean, he's probably smells. Really? I'm serious. Probably just a grizzled up old guy. I mean, he spent 20 years in a cave coming up for food. I mean, not out, but just up. 
about every week, maybe every month, you know, just to get a little bit of food. Why do we give him so much attention? Because he, he shows Christ. Anthony used to come out. Once in a while, he would go to the city of Alexandria. Do you know what would happen when Anthony the Great came out of the desert and would go to the city of Alexandria? They would begin to line the streets, the road, while he came to town. Do you know why? Because people would be healed of their diseases when he came to town. He had spent his time with Jesus. What did he do for 20 years in a cave? Fixed his eyes on Jesus. Learned how to lay aside every weight. The devil sent him everything he could throw at him. And so he fixed his eyes on Jesus. And we honor him. But what we really honor is Jesus in him. We'll go farther. Fixing your eyes on Jesus, the beginner, the author, and the finisher of our faith. <clears throat> now, I do not think this is unimportant. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God? When Jesus was on his way to the cross, he had you in mind. Uh, he had me in mind. He had each of us in mind. I do not think <clears throat> that there is any great virtue in getting yourself killed, unless it's for a reason. On the way down here this evening, I heard a story with great virtue of someone who, for, uh, where someone died for her. When Jesus pondered the cross, you know, he turned his face towards Jerusalem. Uh, and when he did, he had to be utterly conscious of what he was doing. In the garden, he sweat as it were great drops of blood. This was not something that he took on just rather casually. And just because he was God in the flesh didn't make it any easier or any less painful. There was a motivation. And the motivation was joy. And his joy was you. His joy was I. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Why the joy? Because we were going to come into a living union with him and we would spend eternity with him. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is sat down, got his work done. That's Kathy Stolp. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Okay. Laying aside the weight, laying aside the sin, fixing your eyes on Jesus. Now I'm going to skip down in the text a ways, and I'm just going to take a few very practical issues this evening. And sometimes these just get overlooked when we work with a book like Hebrews. Pursue peace with all men. I, all 69 years, all I have ever known is religion and church. I grew up in a minister's home. I know what church fights are. I know what church splits are. I know what wars between Christians are. I know what wars between Christians and non-Christians are. I know the agony of what goes on in many a church. And I'm thinking right now particularly in church. Sometimes I think there are people who believe that we are to pursue war. We're to pursue conflict. The one place on God's green earth that there should not be conflict is in the church of the living God. There is no excuse for it. Did you hear me? There is no excuse for war. The church is a place for peace. And we need to pursue it. And pursue is, this is very active. This is, I've done grammar with you almost every night. This is an imperative. Pursue peace. It's an order. You, pursue peace. With the people that agree with you. Pursue peace with those who share a common creed. Pursue peace with those who can say the same creed you said this morning, but who don't add that little other word in there, that little suffix. Pursue peace with all, all people. 
I am in the Antiochian Archdiocese. Yes, we're predominantly Middle Eastern. Yes, every day these days is a grief. It's a grief because what's going on in the Middle East? So what ought we to do in the Middle East? What unorthodox Christians in the Middle East do? We ought to pursue peace. What should a Christian Jew, what should he do or she do? Pursue peace. And not take sides. You say, but it isn't fair and you don't understand. I do too. My people were persecuted too. They tried to drown mine and skewer them in a way I will not describe. I know what it's like to come from that kind of a family. We are told to pursue peace. We pursue peace not only in the church. You need to pursue peace in your neighborhood. You need to pursue peace in your school. You need to pursue peace in your city. You need to pursue peace with everyone. You say, well, are you some kind of a peace nip? Are you someone who's into nonviolence? It hasn't got anything to do with anything. It has to do with a sincere effort to pursue peace, to bring understanding amongst people. Pursue peace amongst all men. Or with all men. Uh, I read it wrong. That's bad. I, it doesn't say pursue peace amongst all men. It said per, pursue peace with all men. I need to be at peace. I, I will tell you, you figured out that we're pretty good friends, haven't you? You know, if I insult you, you're a really good friend of mine. I would never insult anybody who is not a good friend. I insult him all the time. If I don't tease you, I'm either scared of you, or I don't know you very well, or I don't like you. We learned how to pursue peace with one another. Yeah, we really are good friends. It did not come super easy, did it? Because we had to pass the point where the niceties were there. And we had to get to the point where we really dealt with very, very serious issues. And where we had to back back off and where we had to literally pursue peace amongst ourselves. You need to... I'll be honest with you. I'm not saying you should do this. I'm a very passionate man. I don't listen to talk radio. Do you know why? Because I get riled up. And I, I find myself taking sides immediately. I don't listen to Rush Limbaugh. I don't ri listen to Oliver North. I don't listen to any left or right. Sometimes I feel like C.S. Lewis. You know, he wouldn't even read a newspaper. And, he, and he said, somebody said, well, what will happen? What if, what if something big happens? He said, well, we'll find out about it. But I find that I get unsettled in my spirit because I'll start taking sides. I, I'm so passionate that if I turn on a football game and I don't know either team, within 30 seconds I've decided on which team I root for. And then I'm really into it. Part of my pursuit of peace is even being careful with what I read. I'm careful with the op-ed page in my paper. You say, are you advocating ignorance? No, I'm advocating peace. And the pursuit of peace with all people. I have a very interesting parish. I have Republicans and Democrats in my parish. Uh, and I am very, we have a member of the House of Representatives in our parish. And he's a Republican. And so there's a, the tendency to, well, we have, a, we have a member of the House of Representatives in our parish, and we need to support him. You know, I'm for supporting him, but not in the church. Because I have people in my parish that aren't going to vote for him because they don't agree with that. And I want peace at St. Anthony. And you say, well, you've got to take a stand politically. I do not. I need to pursue peace. And we keep political peace 
at St. Anthony. Pursue peace with all men. Now, now he's going to get very pointed. Pursue peace with all men. Probably when I was about 19, I read this first consciously. I've read it many times before because I've read the Bible a great deal by the time I was 19. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Scared me to death. It just simply says without sanctification, you're not going to see the Lord. What is sanctification? Sanctification literally means <clears throat> being set apart. Uh, it comes from sanctus, holy in Latin. And to be sanctified be means to become holified. What does it mean to become holified? It means to be set apart from anything that defiles you. Anything that is profane. Now, it is a dogma of the Orthodox faith that we pursue sanctification. Often we call it, and perhaps very accurately, deification, or at least you cannot separate deification and sanctification, that being conformed to Christ. How do you pursue? It's, it's a pursue still the verb. Pursue peace and sanctification. Same verb, just two objects. Pursue peace with all men and sanctification. How do you pursue sanctification? Well, part of it has to do with what, of what you let profane come into your life. You know what profane is? It just means common. What do you watch on TV? Oh, you say, come on, Father, you're, you're, you're laying laws on us tonight. No, I'm not. All I'm trying to do is to help you pursue sanctification heading toward a city. Heading toward an ultimate goal that's for all eternity. You don't have to watch trash. You don't have to read trash. I happen to know Father Gordon agrees very strongly with, it, me, with me on this. You know, you, we were talking about, on the way down this evening, about what we're being working with college students on campus. I rather imagine that one of the things I'd do if I were back full-time on campus, I'd spend a lot of time with guys on the issue of pornography. Because more Christian guys probably get profaned with pornography than almost anything else. It's so utterly available, particularly on a college campus, because everybody, every kid's got a computer. What you watch, what you let yourself see, what you let yourself hear, the music you listen to, does it make a difference? Yes, it makes a difference. Does the, does what you, do the things you watch, do the things you hear edify you who have the one who has your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith? You need to pay attention to it. It is just so easy to go along with it all. <clears throat> I went into the airport in, in San Diego Thursday morning at... Uh, a relatively early hour, and you know, the TV is there. I don't like TV. Our TV probably is on about three hours a month. Folks, I don't even watch the news. I mean, that's not a boast. I just, I just, I don't watch it because it unsettles me. I read the paper. I mean, I know what happens in the world, and anything I don't know, my wife will tell me. I mean, gently and nicely. She's a nice lady. But I, I, I as I sat down, what I wanted to do was read. And the thing that distracted me the most was the television. And I looked for a lounge in the terminal where there was no television and I couldn't find one. All I wanted to do was read something edifying. But I had to have this going all the time and the, the, the sound coming after me. Work your life around so that you don't have coming into it the stuff that contaminates, that pollutes, that diverts, that takes your attention away. If you have your eyes fixed on Jesus, you're going to be very careful what else you have your eyes fixed upon. Is that not a true statement? If you have your eyes fixed on Jesus, you're going to be careful what you listen to. Is that not true? 
Pay attention to it. There's a reason. There's a reason. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification with which no one can see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. What does it mean to come short of the grace of God? I'm going to say it means two things, or at least it can mean at least two things, to come short of the grace of God. One thing it means to come short of the grace of God is that where you simply do not accept His marvelous grace and where you think that your religious performance, that your keeping of rules and laws and, 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 and doing religious things and spiritual things and even godly things, that that is going to get you somewhere with God in and of itself. Because always you need the grace of God. And I think that probably is what he has in mind foremost here. Come short of the grace of God. You have to have the grace of God in order to get to the city of the New Jerusalem. There is no other way. But a second thing that it means, very closely related, is this. In Orthodox theology, grace is very often defined not as what most of us were raised on unmerited favor, but grace is defined as the name of the book that I have up here, Divine Energy, that we are energized with God's uncreated energies. And to fall short of the grace of God, in this sense, means that you try to do even really good things, but you do it in the effort of the flesh. Just strictly doing it in human effort. So much church life is done only in human effort. Not just orthodox, in every church I've ever been in in my life. So much is done just by human effort. You know what the Bible calls stuff you do in human effort even when it's good? A dead work. The only thing that makes anything alive is it's hooked to God. If it's hooked to the life-giving Spirit, if it's hooked to the Holy Spirit, and it is He who energizes us with the very energies of Christ. You know, the, the Scriptures say, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given unto us. If I'm going to love my neighbor as myself, how am I going to love my neighbor as myself? With the love of God. How am I going to have the love of God? The Holy Spirit gives me the love of God. But I exercise the love of God. There's an interesting passage in uh, Philippians where St. Paul says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That was the part I didn't underline for many years of my life. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You know what the next statement is? For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Work it out. There's two workers. You, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. How can I do that? For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. But if you try to work out your own salvation, folks, you're doing it. You've fallen short of the grace of God. And you'll never make the new Jerusalem. You've fallen short. You need the grace of God. You need His mercy. You need His kindness. You need His energy. You need all of that in your life. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and by it many be defiled. Again, how many times have I seen that root of bitterness come up? Friendships destroyed forever. Because a little root of bitterness got in it. Do you know what happens to a little root of bitterness? You do know, don't you? Little roots of bitterness grow into great trees. How many times there's been an argument over who dedicated the hand cross that gets put on the altar and someone wants to buy a new one. And a root of bitterness springs up. 
and a feud that lasts for years because someone didn't appreciate my grandfather's gift. And the church can be filled with roots of bitterness. Orthodox, Protestant, I don't care who you are, unbeliever, the root of bitterness will always defile others. It cannot help it. It will do it. And that no root of bitterness spring up among, among you, <clears throat> and by it many be defiled. That there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his birthright, his own birthright, for a single meal. I'm not going to labor the issue of immorality. I, I, I'm just, I just, I'm astonished. Now, I like, there's a gentleman by the name of George Barnett. He's a pollster, and he's very, very good. He happens to be a very fine Protestant evangelical Christian. It's one of the, and he probably does the best religious surveys that are done in America. Uh, that isn't all he does. I mean, his, his business is to do polling. Amongst Christians now, do you know that the divorce rate amongst professing Christians is now slightly higher than in the population in general? Do you know that now that out of marriage sex is now essentially accepted just as much within the world of professing Christians as it is with those who are not? I don't really need to define immorality in this audience. He just says, see to it that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his birthright. Do you know what your birthright is in the context of what we've been doing this week? And frankly, it's not just in the context of what we've been doing this week. Your birthright is the kingdom of God and its capital city, the New Jerusalem. You know what will keep you out of it? Treating it lightly. Presumption, immorality, godless of Esau. He comes in from hunting. I'm hungry. Jacob, I'm hungry. Wow. I want some of your stew. I mean, all he, his birthright was the promise of Abraham. That was his birthright, which includes, you know, remember what's Abraham looking for? He's looking for a city whose architect and builder is God. This is Esau's birthright. He has it from his, great, from his grandfather. I'm hungry. And Jacob says, fine, you can have my stew, but give me your birthright. Okay, I'm going to die. It's how lightly he treated it. He missed it. His brother, the steamer, got it. But at least he cared. We don't excuse him for the way he got it. But we admire his determination to get it. And we're astonished at Esau's carelessness about his birthright. Okay, we're, all, we're getting to where I want to go. For you know that afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it with tears. I'm not even going to touch that, because uh, I don't. it's long. Why did I do all these things? Why have I taken this approach tonight? To finish the series. To finish where we started on Thursday evening. Listen to me. Four. We're going to come to a conclusion now. Four. All this stuff. Four. For you have not come to a mountain that may be touched and to a blazing fire and to darkness and gloom and a whirlwind and to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words which sound with such that those who heard they that no one, that no further word should be spoken to them. What's he describing? He's describing the children of Israel in the wilderness at Sinai. That's when, and when the Ten Commandments were about to be given. I mean, this is the place was smoking up. If you think we can smoke up the place in an Orthodox church, you've got another guest coming compared to what this one's like. The whole place is smoking. As a matter of fact, it went so far. For they could not even bear the command, even if a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. 
For in so terrible was the sight that Moses himself said, I am full of fear and trembling. He's drawing a contrast. He said, you have not come to that. That's how the law came. That, that's what he just described. He's, he's going to draw a parallel here to finish the argument. This is how the law came. The, 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 the earthquake and the, and the smoking and the roaring and all of this stuff, the blazing fire and the darkness and the gloom and the trumpet and all of this stuff. This is how the law came. For you have not come to this. Here's the punchline. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem and the myriads of angels to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of righteous men made perfect. This is what you've come to. You didn't come to this old covenant. You didn't come to the law. You came to the city of God. You came, get it again, you came to Mount Zion, the true Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, the myriads of angels. Usually I'm in a divine liturgy at 9.30 on Sunday morning. I had to wait till 2 today to be with the angels. I had to wait till 2. They were there. They were there. Gabriel, Michael, Raphael, I don't know, that's one name. I think there's an angel, an archangel named that. Myriads and myriads and thousands and thousands. Do you know what they were doing today? They were singing. They were singing. Did you hear their song? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Heaven and earth are full of His glory. To the church and general assembly, to the myriads of angels, <clears throat> to the general assembly. You know who the general assembly is? We're part of it. The general assembly, that's all of God's people. That's all God's people, both Old and New Covenant. That's His people. The general assembly and church of the firstborn, all of those who have experienced that new birth, that at least ideally was wrought in you in baptism. Hopefully you have confirmed it over and over again in your personal commitment to Christ. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, uh, <clears throat> to the spirits of righteous men made perfect. In the church I was in today, the truth is, I didn't know their names. They were in a language I don't understand. It wasn't Greek, it wasn't Arabic. I, might have, I, I could have read them if they were in Greek. I couldn't have read them if they were in Arabic, but I think they were in Slavonic. But there they were, and I stood there looking at them. First thing I did when I went into the church, you know, the priest goes in and he, he does prayers. Right away, you know, you, uh, they're prayers of preparation before he does anything else. And I stood there and I looked at the iconostas. And what came to my mind was here I am with the spirits of righteous men made perfect. Standing in front of them was one unrighteous man not yet made perfect, but a man who certainly desires to be one of them. But I certainly want to know their company. It's worth laying aside every weight. It's worth laying aside the sin. It's worth seeking peace with all men. It's worth pursuing sanctification. It's worth not letting that root of bitterness spring up. It's worth not letting that defilement come about because you have come to the church of the living God, to Mount Zion, to the new Jerusalem, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect. And because I'm going to take it slightly out of order, I'll finish with Hebrews 12, <clears throat> uh, 3. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you may not grow weary 
and faint in your minds. Suck it up, folks. Get ready for the journey. Nobody ever said it was going to be easy, did they? You know what Jesus said, didn't you? Don't you? In the world you will have tribulation. So what ought to be my response to that? Well, he told you what your response is to that. So be of good cheer. In the world you'll have tribulation. So be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. It's worth it. It's worth every bit of it. If you can just have that goal in your mind. Oh, sometimes when I preach on this, I would labor the whole issue of the kingdom of God. That's a little broader subject. Uh, the New Jerusalem is sort of the Washington, D.C. of the kingdom of God. You have to have that goal in your mind. And you pursue it with all your heart. And so I exhort you, whether you're a student, no matter a, a housewife, a working mom, dad, I don't care what, pursue with all your heart the goal of being part of that new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride, adorned for her husband. Okay? We'll stop there. And uh, I'll give you some time. Uh, I won't just take any question. I'll take, you know, if I don't want to answer it, I'll just say, I'd rather not answer it. <laughs> okay? Because I can't answer every question. Do you have any questions or any comments? Anything you want to do? I have a question about it. Yes. <clears throat> how the New Jerusalem enters into the orthodox concept of heaven and earth. Heaven and hell, sorry. Oh, of heaven and hell. Uh, <clears throat> I, would, I would work at it this way. You know, I might get tired and feathered for this, and if you want to tire and feather me, that's okay. And if you want to disagree, that's fine, but I happen to know you don't. I do not believe that the Bible teaches that everyone on this earth will go to either heaven or hell as we have often understood heaven or hell. I do think everybody will, will go to heaven or hell in one sense. <clears throat> I do not believe that everyone who is going to not be in eternal torment is going to be in the city of the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem is strictly the people of God, those who have been joined to Christ, the living stones. That is unique. There's no question who those people are. The living stones. The world is filled with people, folks. I'll tell you a story in a moment. The world is filled with people who are not evil people. They have not rejected Jesus Christ. Some of them have never heard. There's probably a few that have rejected him. It's to their credit that they've rejected what they were told about him. Let me tell you an interesting story. I got a phone call from a Baptist missionary one day. It's about 15 years ago. And Baptist missionaries don't usually call Orthodox priests. And he said, Father John. Baptist missionaries don't usually say, Father John. He said, I have a woman in my church that I would like to have you talk to. He said, there's something about her baptism I do not understand. I really don't get it. And he said, I cannot answer her questions. I think she needs to talk to an Orthodox priest. Would you talk to her? Well, I said, well, of course. What's her phone number? He said, I can't give you, I don't even have her phone number. He said, we cannot allow, she cannot allow her phone number to be given out because she has been beaten several times, both when she was in Egypt and in this country. She has been beaten by those who do not like her because of her Christian testimony. He said, I will arrange it. And so with some cloak and dagger work, 
Father Jacqueline Sparks and I met her one day in a city in California. And here is the story she told us. She said, when I was uh, 12 years old, I was burned in a very serious fire. And she said, I was burned all over most of my lower body. And they took me to a hospital in, Chi in Cairo. And uh, for a year, they tried to get skin grafts to take on me. And they would not take. I just simply could not get any healing. And she said they moved me to a children's hospital. And one day in the children's hospital, a British woman missionary came to the ward and told Bible stories. She said, I was from a Muslim family. And I knew I was an, I'm not supposed to listen to the Bible stories, but I couldn't help but hear the story. And so she said that uh, after the woman finished telling the story of Jesus, she said, I did something that I really knew I wasn't supposed to do. But because I had been there for a year and there had been no help, she said, I prayed to the Jesus that the woman missionary told me about. And she said, remarkably, within a day, my skin grafts began to take. And she said, I had not the slightest doubt that I had been healed by the Jesus that I had prayed to. She said, I went back to my home and to my parents. The reason I bring the story up, because this is what she said. She said, my mother was the most godly person I knew. Jesus said, other sheep I have that are not of this fold. I assume that this young woman, this woman was now in almost 50. Uh, but I can't, now that I started the story, I can't fail to tell you the rest. So this is a humdinger. Uh, you know, people who say Orthodox aren't charismatic, <laughs> maybe we're a little too charismatic at times. Here's what happened. The point, the reason I told the story, because here is a very vital Christian woman describing her mother, a Muslim, as a very godly woman. And my God is going to send that mom to hell? I don't believe it. But I don't believe she will be a part of the city of the New Jerusalem with her daughter. She may live in it. She may have an apartment or a condo. I'm being trite. But i got to tell you the rest of the story. When the woman was 18, she went to the priest. And uh, I, I assume it was a Coptic priest. She went to the priest and she said, I want to be baptized. And he said, you what? He said, I, she said, I want to be baptized. Oh, he said, you do not want to be baptized. That's the silliest thing I have ever heard. And she said, no, I want to be baptized. And he said, well, why would you want to do such a silly thing as that? Well, she said, and then she told him the story. Oh, he said, no, no, that's really nice, and I'm glad that happened to you, but you do not want to be baptized. And she said, I got incensed, and I let him know I was incensed, and that I was going to insist on being baptized. And he said, I'll baptize you on Thursday. He just had to find out why she was there, because his church could be raised to the ground. But worse than that, she could be killed by her own father. Because this is a no-no. It's more than a no-no. It's just absolutely forbidden. On Thursday, there were about 25 or 30 people in the church. And this young woman, this 18-year-old, was baptized. Can you imagine what a Coptic church that centuries old looks like. You know, there are no windows. The only light in the place is candle or oil. When she comes up out of the water, the church lights up like the road to Damascus with uncreated light. Glow brighter than noonday. This is why my Baptist missionary friend could not understand. 
what had happened. He could figure out it was something like St. Paul on the road to Damascus, but he just never had an experience like that. Now, he's a very good man. I'm not putting, he's a very, very fine man. He had just no experience like this. I mean, it wasn't seen by one or two people. It was seen by everyone in the church. And, uh, of course, there were great crises. I mean, and she could not go back home. And uh, the church took her under their care, and they took care of her. And, and uh, her, she actually, her job was to try to counsel uh, Christian women not to marry guys outside of their, uh, of their, their faith. And she was beaten in Egypt, and she fled to America, but she was followed to America, and, some, and on several occasions beaten severely in America. <clears throat> but still, it's a marvelous story, but the point of the story that I wanted for you was there are many people on this earth who, according to Paul in the second chapter of Romans, they do that which is right. They do it. God does not condemn them. But on the other hand, no, they do not become part of the, uh, they are not a part of the body of Christ. They are not a part of the New Jerusalem. In, in some of our thinking, and this is specifically your to your question, we must not think of heaven as being just this little group of folks in this little spot. No, this is a grand and great kingdom. <clears throat> the kingdom of God is more grand than anything earth has ever known. <clears throat> you know, I don't, <clears throat> I don't know what's all out there. I happen to be very fascinated with science. And I generally read about an hour and a half late at night. I read science. Uh, I, I'm into microbiology and biochemistry. I'm into uh, geology. And I'm into astrophysics and stuff like this. I enjoy it. I mean, I read it... Uh, partly for recreation, but I have a very specific reason. The best we know, there are trillions of galaxies. Not trillions of stars, trillions of galaxies. Why are they all out there? Well, amongst other things, most of them, they're necessary for life on Earth to be lived the way it is. But I imagine God has a plan for every one of those in eternity. I don't know. I don't know, that's very much speculative. I do know this, that the kingdom of God is more grand than anything earth has ever known or ever will know, and eye has not seen, and ear has not heard, neither has it entered the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And there are going to be many loved ones. There are going to be many. It says, it says in the book of Revelation, when talking about the New Jerusalem, the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Well, they're not a part of it. They just bring their glory into it. Uh, God will be glorified into all eternity. I know this. There will be no more suffering, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more tears, no more sin. All of that will have passed away. As a matter of fact, if I'd have finished the 12th chapter of Hebrews, it would have said that too. He says, I'm going to shake the place once more. So uh, does that help? And I, 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 think, I think I'm on very comfortable ground on, on the orthodox view here of heaven and hell. The tendency is that, you know, uh, here, we, here we go, Dan, in four to eight hours a week, it's very hard to communicate uh, what, we, what we believe on this. And, and the presumption... In, in the world from which I came, uh, that <clears throat> there's a church in Canada called the People's Church in Toronto, Canada. And it's a very famous missionary church. It's a Protestant church. Now understand, I'm not knocking Protestants, but I do not agree with what this church did. They would hold a missionary conference every year, and they were the number one giving missionary church in North America per capita. And it was a very large church, several thousand members. And at their missionary conference, what they, they would have, while the preacher was preaching on missions, they, they would have a, a red light flashing on and off. And the point of that was that every time that light flashed, another soul went to hell. And that was the motivation for giving. Well, I admire the earnestness, but I don't think that's good theology. That some person on some wayward, some desert island 
uh, who sought with all his or her heart to do what was right because the, the law of God is written on the heart. It's just there. I do remember a friend of mine who prayed a prayer like this. <clears throat> he, he was an American, uh, but he uh, prayed it, I think he was in Switzerland when he prayed the prayer. He said, oh God, if there is a God, and I don't believe there is, I want you to do something for me, but I don't believe you can. I want you to do it, but I don't believe you will. And you know, his life was actually transformed. Because God met him. We must be very careful about what we do with the unbelieving world. What we do is witness to Christ. What we do is fix our eyes on Jesus. And what we want to be sure we don't do is to take the role of God. We dare not say to someone, you are going to go to hell. I, I am not the judge. God is the judge. I want nothing to do with judgment. I cannot think of anybody I really want to go to hell. I honestly can't think of anybody I want to go there. It is the most gruesome thing I have ever read of in my life. It is a place of eternal torment. I wrote a book on hell. Didn't sell well. <laughs> but I, what I did is I took the whole tradition of the church. I studied the tradition of the church in its entirety. What is the view of hell? Place of eternal torment. Jesus said more about hell than anyone, any biblical writer, any person in the Bible. Jesus had more to say about it. But he also said, other sheep I have that are not of this fold. We must be really careful with it. On the other hand, that doesn't mean we should let our flag, our missionary zeal flag. It doesn't mean we should be careless. It doesn't mean that somebody's just as well off without Christ as with Christ. Because to be joined to the living, glorified humanity of Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of God, is beyond compare. The surpassing greatness. There's nothing like it. Something else? Out of curiosity, do you think that that eschatology could possibly stretch into, say, universal reconciliation that nobody was going to go to hell and everybody was going to go to hell? Regarding biblical interpretation, is no. Uh, Origen had the devil getting saved, ultimately. Uh, and uh, Gregory of Nyssa sort of had a universal salvation. Every father in the church had something wrong. I mean, we, 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 the scriptures are one thing, the fathers of the church are another, but we find the consensus of the fathers of the church in, when it comes to understanding what's in here. How are we going to interpret it? According to what kind of a lunch I had today, which was good? Uh, or is it going to be, you know, if I had a bad day? You know, in other words, there's no room for private interpretation of scripture. But just because I think the scripture means one thing doesn't mean it's so. We have spent many hours, many hours interacting and not just between our own opinions on Scripture, but the whole group of us, and then bringing into it everything we could in terms of what is the, what is the understanding of the church. What is the witness of the Holy Spirit over these uh, 2,000 years as to what the Scripture means? It's an, interesting, it's an important question. I don't think it's idle. Because I, I do not believe there is any... There, you have to contradict Jesus. You have to say, Jesus said it is a place of eternal torment. I don't even know what all that means. I mean, because you don't have a body. I don't even understand what it's all about. One or two more, we'll bail out and go home. <laughs> Make it short. <laughs> uh, well, it's about the part of getting ready for prayer. And what came to mind was before enlightenment, childhood care quarter, after enlightenment, childhood care quarter. I'm always trying to perfect my prayer life. And, and Bishop Ware, to me, was an example of someone who says that Jesus is here all the time. So if you try to pray constantly, like he does, then there wouldn't be getting any ready for prayer because you'd be praying to pray. But I want to know in seminary, do people, because I know people who went to seminary, do they inscribe liturgy in their person? And how much do you believe in just talking to God versus, let's say, recalling specific passages, listening to what you said and carrying those passages from Hebrews 
with you through the week and recalling them in your prayer. Uh, remembering the liturgy. What is there anything to like singing the liturgy yourself out of your little book uh, in morning, evening, and night, and actually memorizing it? I'm sure most Orthodox Christians have memorized the liturgy. The answer to all of that is yes. It's all helpful. There's so much is helpful. Uh, but many of us, you know, I'm being a little bit facetious here, but you know, sometimes we can spend more time getting our little candles ready or getting our icons put in the right spot. I, I do use icons. I don't only pray with icons, but I like them. You know, from an iconoclast background, and I would have been an icon smasher. I would have been <clears throat> to one who loves them. Because then I'm very conscious I'm not praying alone. I pray better with people than I do alone. My mind doesn't wander as much when I'm with people as when... The... So actually you do get ready for prayer when you pray for, with people. Oh, I get ready. And, I, and then I use, then I use uh, you know, I, my name is Jonathan. I don't ever get called that. But my patron saint is the Holy Prince Jonathan. And I have an icon that a friend of mine did for me. He wrote it for me. Uh, of the Holy Prince Jonathan, and I love to have him there. He's in my office. So when you say I'm never alone, I'm there, there's about, when I'm in my office, there's probably about 30, 40 of us in there. It helps the atmosphere. It, it helps the environment. It gets a little crowded at times, but uh, somehow they don't take up much space. And uh, I enjoy it. But it's, it, yes, um, it's good to memorize the liturgy. It's, uh, I find myself so often pieces of services come to my mind. I find, uh, I remember when I first went to St. Nicholas Cathedral in Los Angeles, <clears throat> and I found out some of these old uh, Arabic women would stand there and they're saying the liturgy. They're saying the whole liturgy. I had a funny one at St. Anthony. I had a woman who uh, just went to be with the Lord of uh, within the last year, Minerva Abraham. A very remarkable woman, came out of Pittsburgh, but ended up in San Diego. Not only did she know the liturgy by heart, but normally she would say it out loud while I was saying it. And sometimes, they, and then she got Alzheimer's. And the more she was into Alzheimer's, the louder she got. And so here I'm coming down the aisle in the great entrance and, and she's doing it all, you know. And, but you know, it did not offend. Nobody was offended by it. I would have probably stomped on somebody who was just trying to show up, but Minerva Abraham was not trying to show up. She was just showing up. <laughs> and that was wonderful. There's so many things. That's why, uh, that's why this faith is such a rich thing. There are so, there are so many, there are so many tools, if you want to call them that, but they're more than, they're realities. So many things you can use that help you fix your eyes on Jesus. Just make sure you're looking for Jesus in everything you use. You light a candle? Why do you light a candle? Because he's the light of the world. You don't light a candle because it makes you feel more religious. That's a lousy reason to light a candle. Lighting a candle makes me feel more religious. Okay. But we light the candle because Jesus is the light of the world. That's why, by the way, why there were many Orthodox churches that don't have any windows. The only light in there was going to be candle or oil. Because Jesus is the light of the world. That's why they wanted it that way. It's fine. 